Hi everyone, this is Brittany Bond, and welcome back to the podcast. Ooh, it feels so juicy and fun to be back on board making these podcasts. I definitely have taken a hiatus to fucking heal myself. <laughs> I feel like that is a that is an ongoing <laughs> forever thing as a human because we're choosing to keep experiencing more beautiful things, sometimes painful things. But anyways, I took some time off. I went into nature. <sighs> I felt very yummy in my body. And now I'm back here in Chiang Mai for another week to work with my friend Daria, build out a lot of beautiful things um, for you. And yeah, just, wow, there's so many things I want to say all at once. Sometimes they get congested in my brain. But in this podcast, I wanted to share more about my ongoing journey of being this empowered woman in the timeline. And after, you know, breaking up with someone that I thought was going to be like the father of my children and build the new earth with me and like, you know, my life partner, what happens now? And if you're, have you, if you have gone through this or if you are currently going through a breakup, or if you're just like trying to figure out what you're doing with your life or, you know, be an empowered version of yourself on the timeline, this podcast is for you. <laughs> we are all going through it. <sighs> I hope you enjoyed the the, woo, the one I made yesterday with Josh. Uh, I love Josh in the sense that he is always going to be in my life in a very beautiful, inspiring way. Right after that podcast, we went and like smashed a bunch of things. So if you haven't listened to that one um, yet, it's called Am I in Love Again? And I highly recommend listening to that one with Josh. It's really fun. Uh, but yeah, yesterday we ended up going to this place called The Rage Room where you can like smash things like and they put on like metal music, which I don't listen to normally. And it took me a really long time to feel comfortable in my body connecting to my anger and my rage um and even when i hit like they give you like these metal baseball bats and you like literally break bottles and smash things you can apparently bring whatever you want to smash uh but we didn't have anything to bring my friend rachel brought one wine bottle but we just ended up breaking whatever they had <laughs> and uh it took me like three bottles to get used to being okay with connecting to my anger and my pain and my rage and then after that it was just a free-for-all I was like imagining someone's face imagining this moment of betrayal imagining like yeah just all of the fucked up things that have happened recently and then taking that anger and that pain and that frustration out on a bottle and that's that was really great I had to go home and like ground uh, Josh and I ended up cuddling for a while because we both were just feeling if you've ever done shabari, like ropes, uh, it felt like that, like when you come out of the ropes or if you've ever done, you know, like physical combat or something like it's like this high adrenaline feeling. Imagine anything that causes high adrenaline and then afterwards your body needs to integrate. And that's how I felt. I just felt like very raw and real and in my body, but it needed to be somewhere that was safe and nourishing and, you know, be able to come back into my body in a way that felt good for me. So that's what I did, and that was really great. And that's been, like, such a beautiful part of this healing process because, yeah, it's, I'm so programmed as a woman to just act like everything's okay. And also imagine for me, for most of my life, I, like, I haven't had support network. I don't have family, physical family that I can go home to. Um, my, because I left my religion, my family won't speak to me. They're very in this religion that I consider a cult. And from for the last 10 years it's been me on my own and um until i built my own you know stability within my life and a foundation for myself but when things would go wrong i didn't have anyone to fall back on i didn't have a support network and so then i built my support network this is why i really believe that building soul family building what i call chosen family people that show up for you in the same way that like traditionally blood family is supposed to show up for you, you can make this. If you don't have a family, a blood family that resonates with you on the path that you are taking, the path that your soul meant for you to take in this timeline, you can build that. You can surround yourself with people that are inspiring and supportive and nourishing and reaffirming of like what you're meant to do here in the timeline. 
So activating you to do that if you haven't and you need it. Um, so yeah, I have done that over the last 10 years, but there's been many times where I was really going through it and I didn't have anyone as a support network. So I just survival mechanism. I just was like, it's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. It's fine. And when it's like not fine, you know, and you just end up shoving that down. If you're not able to release the energy and the emotions in a healthy way, yeah, it stays on your body. This is what physical pain comes from. If you start getting like physical pain in your body, if you get a disease, if you get, um, yeah, any infections, all this stuff. This is like your body is saying to you that something is out of alignment that you're not looking at. Like you're literally not processing something and it's giving you this red flag like, hey, I'm trying to tell you that you're storing energy in our body in a way that doesn't feel good. So look at this. So anyways, I've had a lot of that. For me, it comes up in like a lot of shoulder pain on my right side, which is the masculine side, which means like I'm taking on responsibility for things that are not mine. And the way that I've been able to deal with that is really connect to the universe. You can call it God, universe, source, but like this bigger part of us that is not here in the physical that I know really has my best interests at heart and I can lean on. You know, I do my part in the 3D and also believe that I deserve all the things. I do my manifesting rituals. Um, and the rest of it, you have to let go. Some people say let go and let God. I say let go and trust the universe that it's all meant to happen for you and it's all working out perfectly. Um, another thing that's been really interesting about being up here, I was just looking at my notes if you're watching visually, um, about being up here in Chiang Mai is that, so I'm in Chiang Mai in the north. It's like a city in the north of Thailand and I lived here for four years from 2016 to 2020. I based here. I kept my house and I traveled all over the world. So for six months a year I was here and the rest of the time I was traveling. And so I have a big community here. I used to run the main co-working space. Um, and I forget how many people I know here. So it's been really nice to connect to so many of my friends. And But at the same time, I'm like, why am I in Chiang Mai? Like, I know I'm meant to be here to work with Daria. And it's really good for me to be off the island right now, away from my ex-boyfriend and away from a lot of the energy that's there, just so I can, like, have some clean, energetic space and ground myself. But other than that, I'm like, like for me, Chiang Mai, I've already explored it. I've, I've done all, the th <laughs> I have so many stories about Chiang Mai I could share, but basically I have played the game of Chiang Mai and explored it and done, had such amazing experiences. But for me, the city itself is not activating for me. I'm like, yeah, it's just, it's like at home that you've already been to for so many years and you're like, why am I here? And then I was talking to my godfather, Richard, the other day and Richard and Heather, my godparents, uh, I was on a call with them and they were, I was talking to Richard about like being in Chiang Mai and, you know, figuring out what I'm doing next. I have all these opportunities coming my way and do I want to go to the U.S. right now? Do I want to go back to the island? Do I want to go somewhere else? Like la 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 And I just had this big feeling that I needed to like make a decision of what I'm doing next and this is usually when I'm not aware that the current situation is serving me in some way like basically every situation we're in serves us in some way and so then talking to him I was just casually talking about how how nice it is to be with my friends who have kids here because the way that they have kids like the way they've set up their support network around having children is the way that I would have kids like they are super present with their children. They're, you know, they are parents in the way that I would be like loving and kind and always there for them emotionally and physically. And at the same time, they have built a support network of a maid, a full-time nanny, um, a gardener, a cook, a cleaner, a driver, like, and when I think about like my, me having kids, it's like, I've always thought about it, how I grew up, which was in a very big community. Uh, so yeah, it was a cult, a Christian religion, but the community within the religion was really good people and everyone really cared about each other. And after school, every day we would get dropped off to one of the moms and we would hang out with all the kids. And from a very like young age, I was like babysitting other kids. And I had, um, I would consider them like godparents, like people that were, you know, I was 12 and like a woman who was like 45, she kind of adopted me as her goddaughter and she would pick me up after school and I would hang out with her. So like it was very normal for me to spend time with people that were adults. And it was very normal for me from like 
as soon as I was a responsible child, you know, like an early teenager, I was babysitting the kids behind me. Like this was like a tribe. Like we were working within a tribe and everyone was supporting everyone. And that feeling of just the system that has been built around the community supports the individuals. So it's not all on one parent. It's not all on one person to provide everything for a child. It was the result of a tribe. And I've read, there's a quote somewhere that it like takes a tribe to raise a child. And I've always known that that's true because that's how I was raised. And it has made me the beautifully well-rounded person that I am today. And like I met this girl, this like eight-year-old girl the other day. I was at the hot springs in Qingdao and she comes up and she starts talking to me and I'm like, you know, we just, I, I love kids. So like kids love me. And so once she realized I was like a safe adult, she would just like couldn't stop talking to me. And her dad was like, I'm sorry if she's bothering you. And I was like, no, I love it. I love talking to kids. So I talked to her and she was telling me about how like her mom just left her dad to go have a baby with another husband. And I was just like feeling for this little girl so much. And I was kind of just trying to like, you know, I was playing with her and looking at the butterflies and like building like rock statues and just having fun. We were having fun together, but I was also dropping little things like, just so you know, even if your mom left, you're like, you're worthy of love. And it doesn't mean that you're like, it doesn't mean anything about you. Like this is your mom dealing with her own stuff. And like you, you deserve to be loved just for being you. You don't have to do anything special to be loved. Like th you deserve that. And she was like, okay, let's build this, let's look at this thing, you know, but I know with kids, they listen, even if it's like, <laughs> they're like sponges, even if they don't consciously listen, like something in them is listening. Because I have moments like this where someone said, some, an adult said something to me as a kid, and I like remember it forever. And another thing she said, I was like, well, she's, I asked her, do you have any friends? Because like her dad and her move around a lot. And she's like, oh, I have one or two. And I said, well, I can be your friend if you want. And she said, my dad said I can't be friends with adults. And I was like, well, when I was a kid, I had many adult friends and it was really nice because they understand things a lot more than kids do, like in certain ways and how the world works, as long as they can still be fun. And she was like, oh, OK, then, yeah, we can be friends as long as my dad says it's OK. And I was like, yeah, I totally get that, like safe, you, like, you know, stranger danger and all this stuff. But it, it, it locked something in with me where I was like, wow, I want my child to have such a supportive network around them that it's very normal for them to be friends with adults. And of course, like trusted adults, not like random people they meet at the hot springs. I can understand why her dad said that. Um, but anyways, her dad really liked me. And we had a great conversation. But for me, it just like brought up this thing of like, this is how I want my kids to find it very normal to have many adults in their life that love them and support them. And that yeah, I am their mom and I'm like, their soul chose to be born to me as their mother and I would take full responsibility and love that about them. Like, like I take that on as pride and I will do the work of being their mom and like protective and nourishing and supportive and loving. And at the same time, it's not all on me, you know? And so anyways, talking to my godfather about all this, I was like, wow, this is what, this is a reason why I'm here. One of the main reasons why I'm here in Chiang Mai, because there's multiple of my girlfriends who have kids here and I've just been hanging out with the babies and like, I've always wanted kids. Like when people talk about baby fever, I don't necessarily have baby fever where like my hormones are like, we need to pop out a child right now. I'm just like, I know I will have kids one day. And for me, it just needs to be in an environment that feels safe for my body to have a baby into like as in like I feel supported within this environment to like you know create something in the world from a human standpoint and also of course I need to have a I choose to have a partner that I like want to procreate with like when I look at him he's like yeah I want to make babies with you and also that they're stable and secure and I feel safe with them you know to have children with so that has been super interesting because it also brings up this, this uh, I would call it a limiting belief that I've had. Airplane, if you can hear that. I'm under the airplanes. Um, I have a limiting belief. So my mom literally was like, when you think of like something out of a movie of like the perfect mom, 
like the perfect like housewife from the 1950s. Like this is my mother. Like we would come home from school and she would have like a freshly baked plate of cookies for us. And she'd be like, how was school? Give me a hug. I love you all so much. I have two sisters. And she was like hugging us daily, telling us she loved us, telling us we can do anything in the world. She's an artist, so she was always painting things. She can make clothes out of anything. So her and I would go to the thrift store and like buy, like buy stuff and she would like custom design it to my body. So we were like designing clothes together. And she was also a photographer, like her main job before she married my dad was to be a photographer in Portland, Oregon. And so, like, growing up, we were her models. She was always taking photos of us. She put us in modeling. And in general, she just really loved being a mom. Like, she took that as her main job, that we felt loved and nourished. She was also, like, the most amazing cook and baker. She was always, like, in the kitchen, like, canning something or brewing something. You know, we had a garden where we grew our own fruit. Like, she always tried to grow as much food as we could. And yeah, I just, I felt from a mothering standpoint, my mom got an A plus. Like I feel, I feel that the core of who I am was very supported and nourished as a child because I felt such a secure attachment to my mom. On the flip side, I could feel that, and this is something I couldn't consciously recognize for like many years was that my mom had a dream inside of her that she gave up in order to have us as kids or maybe it was because my dad wasn't supportive of her following any other like he literally just wanted her to be a housewife and when she actually tried to get a job like she ran a bakery for a while she wanted to open her own bakery and my dad was just so not supportive even though he was an entrepreneur and had many companies and was very successful business wise it was like he took pride or some sort of I think self-worth in being the breadwinner like the main person bringing in the money so even when my mom got a job he like made her give him her paycheck so he could still control the money super fucked up lots of things I could say about that I think I've talked about this in a previous podcast but basically what I'm trying to say is that my mom was a really good mom And she loved us so much. And also I felt, I could feel energetically that she gave up a dream that she had to create something in the world because she wasn't supportive in her environment in order to do that and also be a mom. So in her reality, she had to choose. And this is a lot of women in the past um, and a lot of women today where, you know, they don't have the extra support. So like, literally all they can really handle is being a mom and also it it takes a lot of energy it's one of the most amazing things to be a mother in this world and I really respect and honor that and also I feel like for most of my early adulthood I lived out my mother's karma of like when people asked me do you want to have kids I would say no I need to do what I'm meant to do in the world I need to make the impact that I'm meant to make And so I equated in my head with having kids is giving up me, giving up my dreams, giving up whatever I'm meant to do, like this big mission and just kind of sitting at home all day, taking care of my kids. And so I like, it was a very negative thing for me in my head for most of my life, most of my adult life was like, yeah, having kids equals losing my freedom and giving up what I'm meant to do in the world. Like, so this is also why I've always had like really hardcore birth control Because if I do have a kid, it's going to be on my terms. You know, it's not going to be oops or whatever. So when I did ayahuasca a couple years ago, um, I went into, I, I didn't go into ayahuasca, the ceremony asking, should I have kids? Like, again, up until I did this ayahuasca ceremony, I thought, I don't want kids. I'm good. I will be a great auntie to people, to people's kids, my friend's kids. And maybe I'll eventually, I even said, like, maybe I'll adopt a kid in the world because there's so many kids that need a good home. And I remember being a child and with my dad being really abusive, there was moments where I was like, I kind of wish I would go, like, I wish I could take my mom and go to a separate home. Like, I wish my mom and I could leave. (laughs) Um, Anyways, so I went into the ceremony with Ayahuasca asking Mama Ayahuasca to help me heal my trauma because... I knew that I needed to 
work through this in order to make the impact that I meant to make in the world because I've been building communities and companies and traveling and I would get the company or the community up into a certain level and then I couldn't go beyond that level of like depth or financial wealth or whatever, whatever, whatever. And I knew it was me. I knew there was something within my belief system, my vibration that needed to be healed in order for me to expand. And so I went and asked him, um, Ayahuasca, can you help me? I will do what I need to do. And so what she did, uh, she was like, okay, so you want to you wanna fulfill your mission in this timeline? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And she was like, we need to go to your core trauma. I will take you by the hands and we're going to go to the moment that your core trauma happened and we're going to deal with it together and we're going to work through it. And I was like, no. No, I'm good. <laughs> I, uh, this is scary. And so like for, pr- I don't know what time is in an ayahuasca ceremony, but for a while I was like, no, I'm sorry. This is too overwhelming for me. And then she kind of like gave me glimpses of what my life could be like if I was able to work through it. And I was like, oh, okay, fuck. Yeah, I want, I want that life. That's, I want to feel what you're letting me feel right now. This like safety in my body, this full embodiment this confidence like I want to feel that in my everyday life how do I feel that and she was like well you have to go and face your core trauma and I'm like okay let's do it but only if you do it with me so she took it was like she took my inner child by the hand because it happened to me when I was a child and we went into the room where my neighbor who was in his 60s sexually molested me while my dad was in the hospital and my mom was working and this person was supposed to be someone who was supporting our family. And also he masked, he would like cover up um, his sexual abuse by telling my mom that I was mowing the lawn. So I would actually mow the lawn for him, but then he would take me into his office and sexually molest me. And then he would give me $50. <laughs> and at the time we really needed money because in the States there's no medical coverage for, my dad was a contractor. And so um, we really, we were literally living off like food stamps and stuff. We were very, very poor and we weren't sure if my my dad was even going to survive the hospital. So yeah, core trauma all up in there. And anyways, I went into that room with Mama Ayahuasca and I really, I really allowed myself to feel what it felt in that room for that little girl, that little me that was still like stuck in that room basically because I hadn't processed that trauma. And I took that little girl by the hand and I took her out of that room. And so I can, the reason why I can talk about this is because the part of my psyche that was stuck there, the energy that was stuck in my body that was frozen because it was scared is no longer there anymore. I have integrated that part of me. I have healed that part of me and prove to my inner child that I am safe and I will protect her. So now that we cleared that up (laughs) in this ayahuasca ceremony, she showed me what, she showed me a vision of what me in my happiest place is in this world. And it was literally (laughs) me with all of my best friends and we like all lived together in, you know, some sort of like eco village that we had built or we all like, we basically like lived off the land so we grew our own food we primarily lived off of our own food and we all lived near each other and it was just like everyone was like it was like nighttime and everyone was cooking dinner together and laughing and the kids were like running around in between everyone and there was a baby like just bouncing on someone's knee and I just looked around at everyone and I just started crying like I was like in the I was in it like I was fully in this vision as if it was happening and I could feel this feeling of this is it like I literally don't need to go anywhere else I have I have made it airplane (laughs) um and the feeling that I had in my body was just like pure it was like timelessness like when literally like nothing you don't need to go anywhere everyone you love is here in this room And you're just doing exactly what you're meant to do in the world. And like everything that you do next is the same vibration because you're with your favorite people and you're with your children and your partner and 
you, it's just like pure love and bliss and like whatever you go through you do it together as a tribe and that feeling of like tribe and community and being at home and like growing our own food and like raising our kids together I was just I came out of that ceremony and I was like I guess I need to have kids <laughs> like and I even you know I this was maybe four years ago now no three it was three years ago now it was three years ago I had this ayahuasca ceremony and it's still taken me about three years for me to fully allow this into my conscious reality because even after that ceremony I didn't really know how to process that information because I still had this limiting belief that I needed to choose whether I made my impact in the world or I had my children because that's the only lived experience I had witnessed with my family growing up and also culturally like this is also like you know what we see a lot in the world is like a woman is either out there accomplishing her mission or she's at home with the kids and really overwhelmed and I was like I want to woo, I want to have kids and I cho I choose to have my babies in a supportive community with financial security, emotional security and family security, you know, like really supported in all ways and also have the energy and the bandwidth to continue what I meant to do in the world. And so I'm here in Chiang Mai with my friend Dario, who has a one-year-old baby. And she's fully supported, like, by her community that she has built around her. And the people that work for her, they're not, like, workers. They're her, like, soul family. They're, like, her Thai and Burmese family that have been with her for years. And she treats them like family and really takes care of them. And they love her. And they love her child. And they love her husband. And it's just, like, really good energy all around. And I was like oh my God, I can totally have this, you know? And so her and I were talking about this because we're building out a bunch of stuff for my business right now to make this impact in the world and share all of these teachings with you that I've learned over the years. Um, and I said to her, I, I realized while I was here with her this, this last week, this whole limiting belief. And she was like, why can't you have both? I'm doing both. And I was like, yeah, I guess I just hadn't ever seen anyone do it in a way where I would I would have a kid like that um, because there's also a lot of programming we have in the Western world that if you have like support or nannies or something that you're somehow a bad mom but here in Asia like it's affordable first off and you can pay your you can pay your um, workers really really well so you can empower them and also like why would you not like from okay what I want to say is everyone can do it differently. And obviously not everyone is in Asia where it's affordable to have all this help. But I chose to move to Asia. My soul chose to live here. So everyone has that choice if they want to. And I didn't have any support to come here. When I came to Asia, I had just invested all my money into a startup I was running. And I didn't have that much money, you know, but and I built, I built my life. Um, so it's not like, oh, Brittany's privileged. It's like, no, my, I chose to be here and I chose to build my life here. And if I were to have a kid, it would be in this way where I'm fully supported. And also, I love the idea of having it all. Like for me, it was just that I needed to recognize within my psyche that I actually wanted both of these things. Because for a long time, I was going like one direction or the other. And most of it was just suppressing this desire to have children. Um, so yeah, here I am fully single <laughs> and recognizing this and it's also like again I don't feel any pressure I don't feel any scarcity around it it's just this really beautiful realization that I can have it all and I'm sharing this with you so that you can also whatever it is that you are dreaming in your life whatever it is that you're excited to do in your life for you to really recognize that you can have it all it's just more about clearing up some limiting beliefs um, and you know there is something about like seeing how our parents did things and how they chose to live their life a lot of times we are living our lives in reaction to what they either did or didn't do in their life like so it's like we're f that's what I was saying earlier like we're like fulfilling karma for our parents but you don't have to do that you can choose to live a sovereign life you can choose to live your life 
You don't need to live the life that your parents wish they had lived for themselves or live in response to seeing how they're, you know, like if they were, had some negative impact in your life and then like doing the opposite. And what I talked to Daria about was like, it's really important for us to look at the way we were raised and like pick and choose the parts of our, it's like the parts of ourselves that we still resonate with. So for instance, I was raised in a religious cult. And so for many years, wow, the airplane's really loud. It's going to take some water while that happens. For many years, I disconnected from my spirituality because I connected it to the religion and all the pain and like the controlling and the shaming and all these negative things. But that was the religion, not that was not spirituality. But I put those all in one box. I put it on the shelf in my psyche. And I was like, no, I don't want any of that. And since being on Copanyang, I was able to feel safe enough to open that box and find the parts of myself that were in that parts of myself that I resonated with that were in that box and integrate them within myself and say no thank you to the religious shaming and the control. Those things can go away. Those I release those. Those are not part of my timeline. Those are not part of my life. And I don't need those in my life. But if there's parts of you that you have put away in boxes in your psyche or disconnected with in some way because they remind you of your parents or remind you of how you were raised and you connect that with a lot of pain or something negative, it's really interesting to look at it from an empower perspective and ask yourself, are there parts of me in here that I actually want to reclaim, but in a beautiful way, in an empowered way, in a positive way that feels good in my body? So for me, that was wanting to have kids I had really put that away like because I associated it with my mom and I felt her I could feel the energy of her giving up some her dream in some way to have us and just her like her anger my mom's a manifester on the human design I could just feel a lot of her anger that she wasn't living the life that she needed to live and that's her choice and also I don't need to go the other extreme and just like not have kids just because I could tell that she was upset at not being able to have kids in the way that she needed to, you know, or feel supported to be able to do everything else she was meant to do in the world. Anyways, so that's that. Um, yeah, it was really interesting because also part of this was like to the, my mom, I think my mom's dream actually was to have her own bakery and like literally like she just wanted to bake and make people feel good. Like if you ever seen the movie like cho chocolate, chocolate, um, that's my mother. Um, but for me, because I took on her karma and like went out in the world and like accomplished many things in the 3D, I literally didn't learn to cook growing up because I associated that with my mother's disempowerment. And I actually really enjoy cooking and baking when I feel comfortable to do it. But it has such an interesting psychological aspect to it that for most people does not exist. And I didn't even understand for a long time. And so I was talking to Daria about this and I was like, yeah, I like, um, I have a really hard time allowing myself to like bake, even though I'm really good at it. And and she's like, well, why can't you bake a pie and run an empire at the same time? Like, why do you have to choose one or the other? And I was like, yeah, why do I have to choose one or the other? So in one of my courses and one of my videos soon, I would, I'm, going to, I'm going to make a pie while I teach a lesson, a business lesson, so that I can prove to my own psyche that I can do both at once. I can be this beautiful homemaker that I am and make everything feel cozy and yummy and I can also empower all of you at the same time. And for me, that is very healing. And I'm going to do that. So watch this space. Um, I want to share with you. First off, I invite you to take a deep breath while I drink water. So we can do both at once. I wanted to share with you a download that I had this morning when I was journaling which was that um, most of the world is 
you know, doing their best to make a living or make their impact or, you know, like we are programmed to basically be like these machines, like these cogs in the wheel of like making the the companies that we work with running and making our lives run and all this stuff. But we've really lost, for most people, they've lost their connection to their joy. They, they've lost their connection to having fun. And I had this huge tunnel this morning where I was like, what if like none of this matters except for how much fun you have while you're doing it? And I say this from the perspective of for most of my life being a very serious person. So this is like a new idea for me. Um, and the reason why I was so serious for so long is because I could feel that I meant to make this huge impact in the world. And also because I needed to create safety and security for myself financially because I didn't have that with anyone else. I didn't have that with my family background. And so I went out in the world and I did this for myself, but I really lost a lot of times my my connection to my inner child and my connection to... Whatever I'm doing, it, let's make it the most fun possible. So even when I'm at work, like, am I working with people that are fun? Am I having fun while I'm making this impact in the world? And I feel like most people are, were like how I used to be, where they were really out of balance in it needs to be serious, it needs to be work, and this is just what you do, and you need to grind through. It's very masculine in the way that it's done, in the sense of, like, push through, go harder, da, 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 da. I don't, I don't resonate with that anymore. First off, I'm a woman and I really enjoy making every single moment feel as yummy as possible in my body. And by me feeling as yummy as possible in my body, I share this energy with everyone around me so that they also feel really yummy in their body. And I feel like we can carry this energy, whether you're a man or a woman, you can carry this energy of joy and feeling good in your body and making every moment fun and enjoyable just by choosing that and setting that as an intention. I had a business, I'll give you an example. I had a business call this morning where someone wants me to be the face of their company and their CFO, um, chief financial officer. And the person was in a lot of stress, the, the, the CEO, the founder I was talking to, and he had a lot of personal, so like he was missing flights, he was in between flights, he was in a hotel and he was really stressed out and also like jet lagged, like he hadn't had that much sleep. But he wants to have me part of his company and so he was trying to push aside um, his own, whatever he was going through and like have a business meeting with me. And I could feel his anxiety like literally energetically I was absorbing his anxiousness in his body and so I interrupted him I was like hey can, can I just stop you for a second and can we just take five minutes to talk about how you are feeling because I can feel how you're feeling and I want to create a safe space for you to to share your feelings so you can let this energy out so then we can have a nice meeting from that place and he was like oh, okay yeah so this is what's going on and, you know, I need to get to this place because I have this meeting and I'm just really stressed out and I haven't done it. And I was like, oh, and I could see his whole body like softening and like relaxing and grounding. And I was like, how do you feel now? And he's like, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you for just he's like, I didn't want you to think that, like, you know, this is our first meeting and I didn't want you to think bad of me. And I really want you to be part of our company. I was like, all of that is great. And I resonate with everything you're saying, but for me, I've already proven to myself in the 3D that I can do all the things. Like, I've already accomplished things. I'm not trying to prove myself to anyone or anything anymore. So for me, it's I said this to him. I was like, the most important thing for me is that whoever I am working with, it's fun. And we can be real with each other and we can be supportive of each other. And I met him through one of my soul family, Aaron. Um, he's like my brother. So just having like for me my goal is to work with everyone that I feel as if we are soul family so then like again this resonates with my ayahuasca vision which is like it doesn't matter what we're doing together because the beingness of being together feels like home it feels like we have arrived and it feels like we can be ourselves all the way and feel fully supported so even me meeting this person for the first time on a video call I choose that whoever I work with 
we can feel fully supportive of each other. And this is why I said to him, I was like, I'm going to have days where I'm having a super bad day and I need, I need to know that you, I can feel comfortable to be real with you. And he was like, yeah, this is like really resonates with me. And this is, this is also how I operate. And I'm sharing this with all of you because I think it takes us who are conscious of this to initiate first, because as like, like, you know, me coming from a corporate background, it's so normal to push through emotionally. So I'm having a really bad day. I get into a work meeting with people I work with every single day for years. And I don't feel comfortable to be my real self of what's happening. For me, I don't want to work with those people. I don't want to, I don't want to be in that environment. I need to feel that I can actually be myself. So it might be too vulnerable for you to share like, hey, this is what I'm going through first. But if you notice a colleague, if you notice a friend, if you notice a business partner, and you can tell and you can feel energetically that they are going through something, I really invite you to create a safe space for your friend, your family member, your work colleague, and just say, hey, can we take five minutes? And I want to just hold a safe space for you to sh like share your feelings because I can feel them. And I think it's better if we just address them and let them go through you, you know, and that creates so much safety and so much connection and so much of like, yeah, we're doing this together. This is what matters. It's not how much money we're going to make this year. It's not all these 3D accomplishments. It's like at the end of the day, did I feel like supported and that I could be myself and feel like people cared about me? Like I'm connected to my tribe. I'm supported by my tribe. And in today's world, in like our workplace environments, I just find it so bizarre. And I worked in these environments for like 10 years where I just find it so bizarre that you go to a job with people every single day, you're around their energy, their vibration, their emotional capacity, and you don't even connect with them on a personal level a lot of times. And you're just like pushing down all of your personal things. Whereas like... In tribes, we all knew what everyone was going through. So if you show up in a tribe and you're like going to go hunting with someone, they know what just happened with you and your wife or with you and your kids. Like everyone knows everything. And then even in the agricultural revolution that we had, you still like if you were a farmer, you would farm with your family and your neighbors were your friends and you were all in on the crops together and you were all supporting it together. It was still like this we are connected, we are fully integrated as a tribe and a community. When we got to the Industrial Revolution where everyone worked in factories, this is when things got very disconnected. This is when people went into jobs for the first time with people they didn't know and didn't care about and felt, and they were disconnected from their family back at home. And this is kind of what we have created in modern day corporations. I find all of this super fascinating because for me, like a part of my mission is to help people to come back to that feeling of being at home in their bodies, within their communities, and and then activating all of you to initiate this feeling. Like once you feel it in your body and once you have that vibration encoded in you, you can activate that in others. It's like this beautiful vibrational like you know, they have this illustration of a uh, star seeds, like those ones that are here to help activate the collective. Like uh, there's like this grid and we're lighting up the grid. Uh, and then just by being this vibration, you can light up vibrationally everyone around you. So it's a subconscious activation. You don't even need to say anything a lot of times, it's just who you are as a person and how you carry yourself. And, and this is why I say a lot of times the second half of spiritual awakening the first half is understanding the reality that we're in the structure of reality us in this world timeline but the second part is the embodiment choosing to carry that knowledge and be this awakened person that is kind and caring and connective into your everyday life and can you do that can you hold both of those things because that's the point of spiritual awakening it's not to go and like live in La La Land on Copanyang. It's to live, like all of you who are not on Copanyang, you are part of this mission even more maybe than th the people that are on Copanyang because you're actively showing up every single day in a reality where you are outnumbered vibrationally. That is so fucking brave. That is so brave. 
That is like one of the hardest missions. I've done that mission for years in corporate. And it was very hard. I understand the feeling that a lot of you have of tiredness and overwhelm and disconnection, just feeling very alone. And that's why I feel really called to make these podcasts a lot of times like just to remind you, if nothing else, that you are not alone, that you are part of a tribe. We are an online community. We are a vibration like the new earth initially is a vibration. And so if you resonate airplane, I don't know how much you guys can hear the airplanes, but for me, it's like I'm very noise sensitive. But if you resonate to these podcasts that I'm making, if you resonate to the idea that we individually can shift, that we can literally make an impact in how the world is shifting to a more connective place, to a more safe place, um, then you're part of this. Then, then you, you're part of the mission. Like You don't need someone like me to tell you. Like You know it yourself. Your soul knows it. Um, in the podcast yesterday, Josh was saying something that really resonated with me. He was like, I've, a lot of people are asking, like, what would you do if you weren't afraid? You know, because people are like, what am I meant to do in my life? And, and, what, and the thing is, if you take fear out of the way, we, a lot of us know what we're meant to do. We're just afraid to do it. But it's because most of us, we're not meant to do it alone. We're meant to do it supported by a community. We're meant to do it together. Because again, in a tribe, you did everything together. And that's what made it fun. That's what made it worth it. That's what made it matter was the fact that you did it together. This is also what I'm building out with Daria is ways for where we can all come together more online and in person and build this tribe, like actually build it. So all of that is coming. Um, I have so much more I could say, but I think I'm just going to start making more podcasts. So stay tuned. And I'm sending you all lots of love. And, oh, I wanted to let you know, some of you might not realize, but I have an AI clone of myself. I'll put it in the notes here because right now it's still in beta. But basically you can talk to me on Telegram and it's still it's free right now. So I really recommend trying it. You can ask any question. It's all confidential. And it's really fun. Like I was saying today in an Insta story, like I even talk to myself on there. Like I talk to my clone, like, help me. Can you give me some empowerment? What should I do in this situation? And then she reminds me of things I already know because she is me. But a lot of times we just already know it and we just need the support and the reminder. So, um, yeah, click on the link uh, in the show notes um, and talk to my clone. It's really fun. It's like, what is this? What is this universe we're creating? It's beautiful. And also, um, I have some openings next week for human design reading. So if that's something that's activating for you and exciting, you can reach out to me. Um, on Instagram to book it and also I'll put the link in in the show notes here to book a reading okay have a beautiful day and I will see you guys in the next episode bye